The Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Tweedledee and Tweedledum, two brothers who fight. It's very common for brothers to fight. They are viewed, often depicted as twins, dressed as schoolboys. Um, and apparently the poem about Tweedledee and Tweedledum proceeds, came before Alice in Wonder, or Through the Looking Glass. So um, Lewis Carroll took it and expanded it. And he had them recite the poem, The Walrus and the Carpenter. Now, I've done talked about The Walrus and the Carpenter before, and I'll give a link to that uh, down below. And uh, so I don't need to talk much about The Walrus and the Carpenter. It's, it's cute, it's sad, it's funny, it's tragic. Um, but, you know, it's, you know, it's life. It's funny, it's tragic. So you have Tweedledum and Tweedledee, and they're going to fight. But they only have one sword, and they have the umbrella. And you kind of get the impression that they don't really want to fight. And it's more about playing up and getting ready to fight. And they went and they got a saucepan and a coal scuttle, a shovel, and a bolster, which is a big, long pillow, and sheets and bedspreads and all sorts of things. So Alice was just wrapping these bits of clothing around, or bits of fabric and furniture and just general whatnot um, around the two of them so that they have padding when they fight, which means that they probably won't really hurt themselves. Uh, they might bang up the pot, they might cut the bolster, but they won't really hurt themselves unless they hit a face or something like that, and they probably won't be aiming for the face of that. But it reminded me a lot of when I was little. I love to make blanket forts. And blanket forts are like this fun thing to do. Uh, you know, you have a tent. There's tents around. Anyway. But blanket forts, what you do is you take a table or the couch and you pull the couch out a little bit from the wall. And you take the blanket and you'd hang it over your head. And so you'd have like this little cave. And it'd just be this quiet little secluded nook and do whatever your imagination takes you. Uh, fight dragons or be Fred Flintstone living in a cave or I can't remember what all else. Flying in a spaceship. Loved flying in a spaceship one. It's like, okay, we're flying in this spaceship just like Star Wars. Because, you know, when I was little I saw Star Wars in the movie theater. Anyway, it's like flying in the spaceship and we're going to the strange new worlds or, oh, we're like in the cave with Aladdin. And eh, maybe a thousand one Arabian Nights is coming. Anyway, so, you know, made a blanket for it. And it's just like you take blankets and chairs and whatever and you stack them up and you crawl through and it's this quiet little secluded place and it's really kind of magic. Um, because it's, well, yes, you're safe in your house. It's not really your house. It becomes something else. It's, it's really kind of a cool thing and it's a fun thing to try. Um, but so that, you know, just them pulling the sheets and the blankets and the stuff just reminded me of building a blanket fort as a kid. And Alice went to ask them, hey, how do I get out of the woods? Like, we gotta tell her a poem. How do I get out of the woods? And they, they started the poem. How do I get out of the woods? And they started the poem again. Now there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who have a way where everything has to go in order. And if you break the order, they have to start again. Uh, one of the stories of when I have not been nice. I. I'm not always a nice person, was there was a telemarketer, and the telemarketer had a spiel, and the telemarketer had to read the script verbatim, and it was just ingrained that he could not do it. I don't know if it was part of his train. It was probably a large part of his training, but uh, the script started out, hello, blah, 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 I'm here to sell you blah, 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 but the moment he said hello, I said hello back acting like a complete idiot. Uh, but every time he said hello, I said hello back. 
And then he stopped. Because once I said hello back, he couldn't bring himself to say the next part of the speech. Whether he memorized it like that or not, I don't know. But hello. Blah, blah, blah. Hello. Hello. There you go. Uh, let's go back to me. Hello. I'm your... Hello. And we did this three or four times before he caught on that the moment he said hello, I was going to say hello. And the moment I said hello, he was going to stop and not be able to start again, except from the beginning. So it's like the third or fourth time after I said hello again, he just kind of froze and then forced himself on. And I was like, no, thank you, but you have a nice day. And it, it wasn't really a nice thing to do, but it wasn't too terrible. I feel a little bit about, bad about it sometimes, but um, always when dealing with people, telemarketers on the phone, even if you've told them lots and lots, just be polite. They're doing their job. Just say, thank you, have a nice day. I'm not interested. But, you know, just end it with, have a nice day. Because, you know, it's a not good job. But, uh, anyway, have a nice day. Oh, uh, Alice and the Crow. The Crow comes because the Crow is part of the poem, and the whole thing goes as part of the poem. Oh, which, you know. We're going to find out what happens with the crow. She thinks she's safe. We'll see if she's safe. But the most interesting thing in the chapter, besides the walrus, well, a few other interesting things in the chapter. If it was, it would be. If it, but as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. And so it's restating the same thing in different ways. Uh, if it was, it would be. If it might be, it could be. But as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. So it's... Once again, you have the rule of threes where three of everything is funny. Um, but it ends up with, as it isn't, it ain't. And ain't is, ain't is a informal dialectical way of saying is not, uh, isn't. Um, so it's accepted in some dialects. It's not accepted in others. And it's one of those kind of cultural shibboleths that say, oh, this is a person from here, and this is a person from there. But the Red King, and there's a whole bunch of stuff here to untangle with the Red King. First of all, Alice forgot that she's a white pawn. Because the Queen said, okay, you're going to be a white pawn, and all you have to do is get to the home row. Get to the row, eight, eighth row. Well, if Alice is a pawn... And she can go up on the king, she can capture the king, and end the game of chess. Because remember, this is through the looking glass and everything is like on a giant chessboard. So she's the white pawn, and so all she would have to do is go up and grab the red king, capture him. I'm not sure what would happen, because that would, in theory, end the game of chess. But if it ends the game of chess... What if she's a figment of the king's imagination? What if she is the dream and ending the chess kicks her out of looking glass land? So Tweedledum and Tweedledee are like, you're not real. You're just part of the king's dream. If you wake him up, he'll disappear. And what if Alice is actually just the king's dream in looking glass land and she's not actually real there? She's only real in the real world, not in the looking glass world. So, and this is one of those things that is a deep philosophical question that's bothered people for years. Because it's like, okay, if you dream and you think you're awake, and you're awake and you think you're awake, how do you know the dream is not real and you're just dreaming now? So you're watching the video and you're dreaming you're watching the video, but you aren't actually watching the video. You're asleep, dreaming of watching the video. This is one of those things that is like, there's no way we can test this. And there's an extension of that where you are actually somebody else's dream. 
Now, there's some mental illnesses that go along where you think you aren't actually real. But philosophically, it's a question that you can ask and you can't really answer. It's like, how do I know that I'm not somebody's dream? And there's... What? Yes, Lolly has a point. Uh, Lolly brought up Descartes, a philosopher around this time, who famously said, Cachido ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Which is saying that because I can act, I must be something that exists. And Alice actually used the same logic. Look at me, I'm crying. I'm crying. These tears. And Tweedledee is like, what, you think those tears are real? No, those tears are just imagined, just like you're imagined. So that, you know, so she actually did use Descartes' logic. I think, therefore, I am. I am a thing that does. So I am. Um, because, you know, it's kind of silly to have actions without causes or events or, you know, actions, actions without objects. Because if you say running, well, what is running? You know, what object is running? Is it a person running? Is it a rabbit running? Running doesn't exist without the thing that runs. And, you know, the wind doesn't exist without the air. So this is all deep, deep head crazy logic. And it's embedded in a 150-year-old children's book, which is really kind of cool. Because at some level, a lot of people intuitively grasp that this may not be real, and this may just be an illusion. This may just be a dream. You take it a step further, this may be somebody else's dream. Uh, some of the Aber Australian Aborigines had a belief that what we are now is actually the dream time and that this is actually the dream and that when they go to sleep they actually wake up into what is real and that this is the dream there's some religion and i can't remember what it was that actually believed that the entire world is just god's dream um and I've seen books based on that premise as well, where it's like, okay, there is God, and we are just being dreamed by God and not actually real. Um, I kind of have to go with the assumption that I'm real, because otherwise it doesn't make any sense. Um, everyone makes assumptions about everything every day. And, you know, it's like, I assume that if I pick something up and drop it, it will fall. And I acknowledge that that's an assumption. I acknowledge that there is a chance that one day I will take something and drop it and it won't fall. But until then, I'm just going to assume that if I drop it, it's going to fall because I don't want to break my coffee cup because, you know, I love my coffee cup. Uh, mostly because of the picture that's on it, but I love my coffee cup, and so I don't want it to fall, so I don't just drop it, even though there's a chance that if I drop it, it won't fall. So we make assumptions every day, and one of those assumptions is we assume we are real, and you have to assume you're real, because if you don't assume you're real, Everything becomes pointless real fast, and you really run the risk of uh, going to some bad places and doing some stupid things. So, you know, just think. Everything is real, and everything has consequences. And, yeah, everything is real, and everything has consequences. And we will see what happens with the crow or the raven.